Welcome to EB-5 Investment Voice, where attorney insights intersects with immigration investments. If you are a foreign investor, domestic fund manager, or enterprising entrepreneur and want to get the most out of the EB-5 program, you have come to the right place. I'm Mark Deal, and I'll be your co-host on this journey. I'm joined by your host, Mona Shaw, and other attorneys at Mona Shaw & Associates, as well as immigration leaders from around the world. So let's get into EB-5 Investment Voice. You know, Mark and Rebecca, the whole EB-5 scenarios have evolved so much. So we thought that today's discussion should really center about what is required if a person has their own project whether they need to rent or buy a regional center, you know, which is the way forward, you know, because we feel that this is an area that a lot of investors need guidance on. I couldn't agree with you more, Mona. We've seen a lot of our investors and our clients now, especially with the increase in the minimum amount that are wanting to do their own projects. As we see, it's a bit more viable at the 900,000 level versus the 500,000 level. Um, You and I have both worked with individuals at the 500 level, Mona, who wanted to do their own and having 500 with direct employees is, is quite hard. That's right. And that's why today on the show, we have not one, but two featured guests. Our first guest that I'd like to introduce is Michael Schoenfeld. Mike has extensive experience in private equity investment, business due diligence, management consulting, and entrepreneurship. It stems from his time he spent at both a private equity firm, AEA Investors, as well as a Boston consulting group prior to joining the EB-5 affiliate network. Mike has also been recognized by Forbes magazine, 30 under 30 national winner for social entrepreneurship. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you very much uh, for having me on. I'm really excited to talk about this topic and dive into the new world of EB-5 and how the regional center fits into it. Yeah, we're excited to have you as well as invite back onto the show, Bernard Rojano. Bernard is a founder and principal consultant at Excite Business Solutions, which is one of the oldest immigrant investment exclusive consulting firm. Bernard has provided expert opinion, business modeling and planning, mergers and acquisitions, project development and management consulting to foreign investors, immigration law firms and U.S. project developers. Bernard, this is your second time on EB5 Investment Voice. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me again. Really appreciate it. Look forward to the show today. I'm looking forward to the show today, too. In fact, we've got five people on, so I'm going to do what I normally do in these panel situations, and that's take a step back. I may interject from time to time, but I'm certainly not going to get in anyone's way. With that being said, Mona, would you like to introduce the topic? You know, Mark and Rebecca, today's discussion we thought would center around what's required for your own project, along with renting or buying a regional center, because we are finding that this is an area that investors do need guidance. I 100% agree with you, Mona, especially now that we've seen the increase in the minimum amount. Uh, We're seeing that more and more of our clients, our investors want to file their own project and we're seeing that it's more viable at the 900,000 level versus the 500,000 level. And Mona, you and I have discussed this plenty of times. I mean, how many times have we said, can you really put together a direct project at the 500,000 level? Right. But I'm sure today we're going to talk about how much we can put a direct project together at the 900 level either. (laughs) So (laughs) whether or not it is going to make a lot more sense to use a regional center and then how to go about it. Yeah. And what we've always told our clients is it's a business first. And we've said that how many times on this podcast? Um, So you look at the business and then from there, you know, if EB-5 works, it works. That's the case. And you're saying how in this podcast, hey, Bloomberg quoted me about that too. (laughs) That's a business first. (laughs) Yeah, sorry, guys, had to throw that in. (laughs) Anyway, it's wonderful to have such a good panel who are so knowledgeable on this. So I'm going to start you guys with a scenario, a typical scenario that I'm sure you've come across many a time. So we have a family of three adults. They all want to get EB-5. Three adults meaning that they have a father who has two children over 21 and the third child is under 21. So he's going to probably do it for himself or his wife with the third child and the older two children who are currently in the United States, say in university or something. So now we're looking at three 900s and they decided that they want to purchase land to build a shopping mall. Mike, you must have seen this type of scenario many times. 
Absolutely. And as you mentioned, we are seeing this, it's happening much more often at the $900,000 level. Before you would see investors that would commit $500,000 to a project without expecting a big return and willing to be more passive. But at the $900,000 level, we are seeing many more investors choose to either do their own project or work with family members on a project. So in this specific example, um, as you described it, this is very commonly what we're seeing now, where it's a family, there could be a few $900,000 investments in a single deal, two or three investors together, buying land, building a shopping mall or another um, small real estate development like that, where it very clearly will have construction jobs and there will be ongoing operations But going through that direct model doesn't really make sense if you need 20 or 30 full-time employees for building and then operating a shopping mall. So every single investor that we've worked with and seen in this new paradigm uh, has ended up going down the regional center path because it is so much more conducive to make sure you can hit that job creation requirement without any risk to the investors of not getting that final I-829 approved in the event that there weren't enough direct jobs and actual W-2 employees by going down the direct path. That's true, Mike. But but just before we actually, I know you've made this conclusion, you've come to this <laughs> conclusion rather, but I just want to explain a few things to our listeners because many times our listeners say, no, we can easily make 10 jobs or we can easily get 20 jobs. But when it comes to a shopping mall, Bernard, how straightforward, remember, this is a direct route, not a regional center. How straightforward is it to get 20 or 30 jobs if you have, uh, if you're constructing a shopping mall? On the construction side, as Mike had mentioned... Oh, this is a direct. We're talking about a direct situation first. Sure, and understood. But, you know, if you're building a shopping mall and you're not going to operate it, all you're going to do is lease it, uh, then your income and your activity is going to be based on dealing with tenants. And so there's not a lot of job creation typically in those scenarios. Now, you may have some property management jobs and some jobs to take care of your tenants. But unless you operate one of the businesses that's housed in your shopping center, you're likely not going to create the direct jobs. Yeah, Rebecca, why is that? Why, why is it not obvious that they're not going to have direct jobs? Because I know our listeners will be listening thinking, well, I don't understand. We are going to have, have a stores in there. We're going to have a 7-Eleven and those are going to be direct jobs. Well, that comes into play with Again, the, the corporate structure is going to be important in this, but um, you know, your new commercial enterprise, your NCE, has to be uh, in a direct project is the entity that must create the jobs. So if you're maybe leasing, as Bernard was saying, you're leasing these 7-Eleven or you know, any of the other shops out, you're not re- really, your entity is not really creating the direct jobs. You're actually, it's, it's tenant occupancy, really. It, it's those jobs that maybe the 7-Eleven itself that are creating the jobs, and those are being created indirectly, but it's not being created directly from your new commercial enterprise. Right. And that's what a lot of times, a lot of people, Mike, I'm sure you'll agree, they don't realize that. They go into their project without realizing that the corporate structure of a direct really doesn't fit the job creation. Exactly. So we we see that quite often. And an example here would be if you're building a retail center like this and you were building a restaurant that you were actually going to operate, then you could count those jobs from the restaurant. And in the direct Mm -hmm. sense, you may have jobs from that. But very often, if you're in the business of constructing a shopping mall or a retail center, you are not in the business of actually operating those businesses below that operate out of the shopping center. So you can't really count those jobs. So there's always some confusion on that. And it takes a while to explain through which jobs are able to be included and which jobs are not able to be included. Yeah. And then we always find that the next segment, which really does convince people that they need a regional center model as opposed to a direct model, is when they count the cost of if we have this scenario where we have to produce 30 jobs, 30 direct jobs, then they realize that how much money you save if you go a regional center route. What do you say to that, Bernard? Well, yeah. You know, when you go with the regional center, not only do you get to count the jobs used in the economic report uh, rather than filing tax records. So I think when you get to 829, we have a lot of clients that choose a regional center, and not necessarily just because they can actually count the jobs, but because they don't have to, they literally, in some cases, can create the jobs directly, but they don't want to run the risk 
of not being able to prove those jobs and not getting the right quantity of jobs. And so with the econometric report, those jobs are basically locked in and uh, using expenditures or uh, revenues. We know exactly how many direct, indirect, and induced jobs are created, and the USCIS can clearly count those that way. So as long as you spend the money or make the income, you've proven up the jobs and the investor can get their visa. But yeah. that's, I think, one of the benefits of the of the regional center as well. I think we can't say how many times it comes that the project just say, it's just not viable for me to have 30 jobs. Exactly. I'm going to go on. I was going to butt in with that as well, Mona. Um, <laughs> you know, with the cost out there, you know, we say 900,000 seems like a lot. And then, of course, if you're accumulating several EB-5s, you know, you're getting a lot out of it. But to have 30 or 40 direct jobs and that you have to pay full-time employees, ultimately, at the end of the day, you're going to end up spending way more than, let's say you put in 2.7 million, you're going to end up spending way more than that um, when it comes to salaries, you know, and on top of that, you have to actually construct or build the project. Yeah. Um, so you have to think about that going in. But Mona, I want to ask you, a lot of our clients, you know, the confusion comes from if I'm doing a my own project can I actually do a regional center project? I think a lot of people get confused with that thinking, if I'm doing my own project, I can only do a direct model. Yeah, this is some an illusion that I think a lot of attorneys really bring forward. They don't realize that, yes, you can have a regional center for your own direct project. Mike, don't you agree that this is really an area I feel that people really need to understand more? Exactly. I completely agree with that. And historically, I think it's because a lot of people thought of a regional center project as a very large hundred investor project in a major city where the investors were passive. But at the end of the day, what the regional center allows you to do is use that indirect job creation. And we are an operator of 14 regional centers that cover a majority of the US. And we work with single investor projects that utilize our regional centers and use the job creation methodology. So it's absolutely critical for investors to understand that even if you only have a one, two or three investor project, you can still have access to the benefits of the regional center model and go underneath that and not have to go down the direct path, which is much more onerous and much more risky in terms of being able to prove the jobs at the end of the day. And much more expensive, actually, even mm-hmm. with all the costs, it is much more expensive to have a direct project. It, it is. And uh, sometimes I've seen the stack of paperwork trying to prove those direct jobs over several years, and it can be binders and binders uh, trying to have enough evidence to show those those tax records and the individual employees in that when if you were looking at the same analysis as if they'd used a regional center, it would have been very simple where you're able to prove the construction expenditures and the audited P&L and you already have the jobs created by using those economic multipliers. So from a compliance perspective and a cost perspective and everything, the regional center really is the, the more clear path in terms of getting the job creation for a vast majority of projects. It really is. And you, you're not wrong on the amount of documents required for a direct. It's many, many reams. <laughs> because don't forget, it's not just the tax and the salary, but you also have to justify that particular position. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So on top of that, Mona, I think with a direct as well, investors, you know, a single investor, it's fine. You, you can, you know, you're investing in your own new commercial enterprise, your NCE, you can create the jobs from that NCE, your assets are all owned from there. But once you start going into multiple investors, and if you're trying to do a direct project, I think it becomes onerous on the fact that you also have to source the additional capital that's going into the NCE. No, I so, didn't think of that, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's where, again, a more of a headache, more paperwork, again, because, you know, obviously with EB-5 investors, you know you have to source their funds, but if you have non-EB-5 capital going into the NCE, you also have to identify the funds and show that it's been lawfully earned. Yeah, you know, we we have a developer who came to us and they did a, they did a pool direct and then they've been doing regional center and one of the new projects they actually we are, we offered them we said oh this could also be a good direct model and they turned around and looked at us and said don't you ever mention the word direct to us again mm. Mm. <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> it gets complicated. You know, you have to make sure that entities matter. You know, your NCE is the one that has to create these jobs and you have to show how is it that this entity is the uh, entity closely responsible for job creation. So if your funds ends up going into some other entity and it's not directly related to your NCE or a wholly owned subsidiary, uh, you could get into a lot of trouble that way. 
Yeah. So right now, say we've decided, our clients have decided that three adults, they're going to use a regional center model. Bernard, should they buy a regional center? Can they buy one? How long does it take to file for their own? Yeah. Um, well, those are great questions. So I think in my experience, what really drives us trying to find and or doing a transaction and finding a regional center for a client to acquire It's based on the fact that they are looking to do multiple projects. In my opinion, if they're only going to do one project, so these three folks are only going to develop one project, then after that, they're filing for their visas and they're no longer going to help any more friends or family down the road. It doesn't really make sense to go ahead and acquire one. So they should do a rental uh, and affiliate with somebody like Mike and find themselves uh, in a sponsor for their project. Now, if you're talking about a family that's in the business of example of developing these shopping centers in multiples and, and their business goals and objectives are to develop these in several different markets, and they are looking for the opportunity to file additional visas, again, for friends, family members, or investors, then at that point in time, I think that it's worth having a conversation about an acquisition. Thank you for that, Bernard. Mike, what are your thoughts on buying a regional center? So in terms of buying an existing regional center, um, USCIS has recently started terminating a lot of regional centers and has actually cut down that's a good the point. number of regional yeah, centers. That's it, a good point. They, they've cut it from almost 1,300 to what are there, like 650 now? Yeah. Some, something around that ballpark. <laughs> so half of oh, them. they went crazy. I, I, it was just noids and noids and noids. <laughs> it's, it's insane. And what, what we found is that if you're looking to buy a regional center, it's important to buy one that was approved relatively recently because USCIS has been terminating those that have been active for over two years that don't have any active projects. So I would say if you're thinking about buying it, that's one key thing to consider. And the other thing is just, it's a lot of work to run a regional center in the future. Mm -hmm. So if you only have a few investors and this is for your own project, do you really want to take on that administrative compliance for the next five, seven, 10 years? No, oh, yeah, I'm um, going to ask you about renting. that. I'm going to ask you about that. <laughs> but Bernard, what are, what are the costs like now if you do want to buy? Say somebody is really, really you know finicky. They said, no, I don't care. I want my own. What what are the costs that they're looking for? They're looking at rather. Sure. Well, uh, yeah. So going back in time a little bit, five, uh, four or five years ago, if you wanted to buy a regional center, you were going to pay quite a bit of a premium. But like Mike mentioned, right now we have uh, several regional centers that have received notices of intent to terminate or, you know, are recently been set up and don't have any projects, don't have any activity and are worried about these terminations that are happening in the USCIS terminating on active regional centers. So they're trying to they're trying to capitalize on their investment and turn that into some kind of a return. So we are seeing prices anywhere from thirty thousand, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Did you say thirty? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, and Bernard, what's the filing fee now yeah. for a new regional center if you were to, to do it right. from scratch? It's like what twenty thousand, nineteen thousand is a filing fee. Oh my god! <laughs> right, the filing fee is nineteen thousand, but it doesn't stop there. That's what we get paid for. Is we have to write a uh, typically we write a project business plan because there's a project or they wouldn't have an interest in the regional center. And then we also write an administrative and operational business plan to show how the new owner is going to own the regionals. I mean, how, how, what they're going to do as far as operating the regional center. And then you have the, the legal fees because it's not just the filing fee. The lawyer has to do the filing. And there is all kinds of documentation and, and the acquisition of the interest of the regional center. So, Mike, you're right. Uh, when you hear twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, you got to add on quite a bit to that. And that number can be anywhere from 50 to another $80,000. It just depends on what your document package looks like and how complicated the acquisition is. So what I'm hearing is that it doesn't make much sense to start a new regional center right now yeah. when there's ones for sale for, for that, okay. that price point. And also the other thing is how long is it taking for your new clients to get regional centers approved to file today? Well, we are hearing back on filings of 924As that are back 24 months. But yep. from that forward, we're not hearing yet. We are getting some, you know, that email that you guys get, Mona, which is that little email that says, hey, give us some <laughs> clarification, right? Mm -hmm. And we're seeing quite a few of those, but no RFE type of communication, you know, so... In the last two years, we've had uh, very little feedback from the USCIS on these exchanges of ownership. 
Yeah. So I think our Ooh. family of three might decide instead of buying, they were going to rent. So, yeah. <laughs> but there is another, there's another issue when of buying and, and you touched on it, Mike, compliance. Now compliance was brought out in a couple of the legislations, which came out earlier. And I do believe there was a lot of talk about people who have their own regional centers paying as much as 20,000 per regional center as just an ordinary fee to the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on the compliance side, I mean, one thing to keep track of is that you actually have to report to USCIS every year if you run a regional center and you have to report on the project itself and on all the investors in it for one project. Probably not that much work, but you still have to make sure you do everything or you jeopardize the entire process if you were to forget to do something. And there is a cost to that. So that is something that, that you absolutely need to keep track of. Right. And, yeah. and the legislation can change at any point, uh, increasing mm -hmm. all of these amounts. Exactly. It could increase the filing fees. It could increase the work. It could it yeah. could completely change the dynamic of operating and running a regional center. Mona, if I could step in, the profile of our client that is acquiring a regional center, you know, we try to advise people when they reach out to us and are going through this process, give them our best opinion on whether to do it or not. Like this scenario of this family of three, it does not make sense. You're absolutely right. I think they need to rent one. But if we get a call from a developer that has a fund management arm to their company and or a fund manager that's trying to enter the space and has already sourced an investor or understands where they're going to source the investors from, these acquisitions make total sense. But again, if you're not going to do multiple projects and you're not and you don't have the disciplines like Mike and his, and his team have to do the compliance size, to operate and, and manage a fund, to operate and manage this type of entity, you really have no business buying one. So we're pretty straightforward telling people that um, we do that, Mike. I mean, we don't want more terminations. That doesn't help anybody on this call or or not on the call, <laughs> you know. So mm -hmm. so we need good people that have the disciplines, that have the budgets, because this takes a lot of money. I mean, marketing projects is not cheap, and maintaining the regional center is not cheap. But right. when you take that type of a client and they're looking to purchase one, they make perfect sense, and the money that they spend is not bad considering the regional center is already approved and it's dormant anyway, is doing nobody any good. Right. Yeah. I have to say though, and not just the money that's putting into it, it's the time and effort as well. Like we said, it like wow. owning a regional center is a full-time job in itself. You know, like you said, you it have is. to maintain, you have to make sure it's not going to get terminated. You have to maintain, you know, if you have more than one projects, the NCEs that are within your regional center, who's complying with the taxes, who, you know, who's doing what. Um, so that in itself can become a, a full-time job. And if you're here just to run a, a business, are you looking to also run and maintain the regional center at the same time? Yeah, that's a great point, uh, Rebecca. You know, which brings me, <laughs> it brings <laughs> me back to renting. Who do you rent from? Because we have to be very careful who you rent from. You don't want to la uh, have a project where the year after you, you filed your project, USCIS suddenly issues annoyed. Exactly. And Mona, let me jump in here because I think that is one of the critical things. Is That was your cue. That, that was your cue, Mother. <laughs> oh, <perfect. laughs> because when, when you rent a regional center, it's a long-term relationship. You're, you're going to be working together five, seven, ten years, depending on the project. And uh, there are historically in EB-5, we're some fly-by-night operators. And part of the reason that we decided to build our network of 14 regional centers was we, we saw a lot of people that should not have been running regional yes. centers uh, oh, originally yes. in the industry. Yes. We've had this conversation before. <laughs> <laughs> many, many times. So yeah, and, and if you're coming in from outside of EB-5 and you don't understand what's going on, it might not be as obvious. But then once you start poking around a little bit and understanding what it takes to run a regional center, you can do your diligence and realize if somebody's qualified to be operating it and if they're going to be around in five years uh, when you're filing your 829s. Well, it could be longer yeah. than five years. It might be eight years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the way the rules and regulations are changing, you know, you need to have someone who's on top of all of that. Exactly. There's some economies of scale there too, which is another part of the reason why we, we set up so many is because once you get the compliance process down, you're able to leverage the scale. Uh, but if it's a one-off operator that only is one regional center and only a project or two, they may not mm -hmm. be focused on this. You're not going to be their top priority. 
Yeah, it's interesting to see how the industry has has evolved because when we first started this, it was third party regional centers. Then from third party interests regional centers, we started getting developer regional centers. And now we have family rental regional centers, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Well, at the end of the day, the regional center's job is to report to the government. It's to make sure everything's in compliance, to track everything and to report. So it's a very systematized business. And and yeah, it is helpful to have the Separation from the developer uh, as well. That way, you can sponsor projects like this. Uh, you you would not see a developer uh, regional center sponsoring a three investor project for somebody else. No, so it's uh, it's good to have these options now. Uh, yeah. Great. So okay, guys, fam, that's scenario number one. Now scenario number two is that this family of three adults now want to bring in their friends and their neighbor and someone else that they just found walking around. So <laughs> it, it makes it a little different. We're not just talking about the size of the fact that they, they need more jobs. So we have a regional center, but there are other documents and other issues that they need to look at. But really, before I go any further, I really need to ask you, Mike, with all the changes in the TEA, TEAs are not so straightforward as to what is a TEA and what isn't a TEA, but you guys have come up with a magic tool, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, thank you. We, uh, we, we spent a long time building this uh, and we just released it a few weeks ago. But now USCIS has given us really clear guidance on what can qualify and what will not qualify as TEAs when historically it was up to individual states to designate what is it or it's not a TEA. Now the rules are black and white. So we built a map where you can go in and put in your address and see immediately if the site qualifies. And if it does, the map automatically generates a report as well, saying that it qualifies and showing all of the backup. So there's nothing else in the industry like it. And we thought this was mm-hmm. a great thing to build so that as a family like this is exploring whether their project's going to work, they don't have to start calling around and asking about the address and, and get involved until they know that it does qualify as a TEA. So we're really excited to have launched that. Yeah, we had a bit of fun on there. <laughs> Not <laughs> myself uh, played around. We, you know, you even have it to the point where you know a lot of times it's it's state or the county, and then you also bring it down right to the actual census tract. Right, and we were surprised because that we even found a couple of places within Manhattan which ended up being a TEA, but they're just little strips. But it just shows that you just don't know where the TEA location is. And and we actually had a client kind of like this situation where it wasn't a retail mall, it was a different business, but it was more of a franchise style business. And they were exploring 10 different leases. And rather than having to do the analysis on each one for TEAs, we sent them the link and they were able to see these three sites could qualify as TEAs. We can move Mm -hmm. forward and and go forward with the EB-5. So it's already helping people figure it out. Yeah, it's helped us a lot. I mean, I can't tell you how many clients come to us and say, just just pick somewhere and tell us, just tell us where where's the TEA. Like, oh, we can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But after that, after we figured out the TEA, um, the next thing we, we obviously need is a business plan. And I cannot tell you how many hundreds and thousands of times we, we speak to a client and they say, oh, we've already got the business plan. Don't worry, I've got it. Can you bring my price down? So Bernard, how many times have you heard that? A lot. Yeah, a lot as well. (laughs) But um, there's still, you know, a a very one-off type of uh, business plan document that needs to be written to be compliant. And then as we sit through this podcast and talk about all these complexities of renting, uh, buy-in, regional centers, uh, direct investment, and just getting a good consultation with professionals, you know, it's important to do that. So that way, you know, what kind of documents you need and who you need to hire. So, I think it's quite important that you uh, get some good help uh, to get the right document drafted. I think what people often forget when when we are doing EB-5 is that business plans, who is your audience? It's not a bank. You know, it's USCIS and they are looking for specifics and those. Yeah, and you also, like in any documents that your legal document that you're doing, you have evidentiary requirements. You have to show where are you getting your figures from. You can't just bring them, pull them out of a hat. Right. And and in this case, it's just critical to hire a good team. When you're thinking about making a $900,000 investment with a big part of the goal is the immigration aspect of it, you want to make sure you get that part of it right. And you can get it right if you structure it up front and do it the right way. Well, if you don't, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, along with the business plan, of course, and then is an area which a lot of times the investors forget, and they forget the importance of it until something goes wrong. And that's the corporate documents. 
And oh my goodness, Rebecca, how have we suffered on on bad corporate documents? Uh. I can't tell you. I can't tell you how many times. I mean, we've even had, again, it's just like the business plan. They're saying, oh, we have it done. Or they're coming and say, oh, I have an operating agreement finished. And you're like, no, this this is no way compliant with EB-5 rules and regulations. Well, it's Um, not just EB-5. So we've seen scenarios many a times, actually, where, for example, there's a group of friends and they have a a shareholders agreement because... (sighs) Some of the friends have put more money in than the others and some want a little bit more control. And that shareholders agreement, forget EB-5. Oh, my goodness. Can that cause problems? Yes, yes. That We've seen a lot of problems ourselves in, in that. I would say with anyone going in with friends and family that, you know, don't just shake hands on it. You go in it the right way because two, three years down the line, you don't know what's going to happen, what's going to come up. And I think with investors as well, Mona, with the corporate documents, like you said, if it's family going in, maybe you just need an operating agreement that maybe that's enough or with a shareholders agreement. But if you're going to think about bringing more investors in, then you really, really have to think about one, your corporate structure, who you're bringing into your corporation. And two, then then from there, what else is required in addition to just an operating agreement? And from the regional center side, that's exactly right. So when mm-hmm. we're looking at a deal and deciding whether or not we want to sponsor it with our regional center, we go through all of those legal documents. And I can't tell you how often it's a friends and family style deal and they come. They don't even have an operating agreement they'll share with Mm. us. Everything was done with handshakes. And we have to say that isn't going to work for EB-5. We're going to need a lot more structure in place before we can think about sponsoring this deal. Mike, are you seeing with friends and family that they're using escrow? Not very often with the friends and family deals. Most of those are a little more informal. The larger projects, we are still seeing escrow, but a lot of the smaller ones, uh, we are not seeing with escrow anymore. And I think that's just a function of the industry changing both away from any hold back for I-526 approvals, which I, I know you've covered on previous podcasts of the escrow structures and how mm-hmm. all of that works. But also in, in the friends and family style deal, a lot of it's done on trust. And if they're not even coming with an operating agreement, you better believe there's not any escrow structure in place. Yeah, yeah. Mike, with 120 something podcasts, we've covered a lot of things <laughs> more than once, but we've covered it from different angles. And again, escrow has evolved. It's not the what it used to be. It used to be really a marketing tool. Then it became more of a safety tool. And, and now it's more of a hindrance because if it's kept in escrow for years and years, and then the money suddenly comes out and the project's finished, well, what do you do with that money? Mm-hmm. Never was at risk. <laughs> Never hit the deal. So <laughs> big, big issues there. So that's those are all things that we look at when as coming in from the regional center and making sure that we're comfortable with the deal to be able to sponsor it. Do you look mm-hmm. at loan documents also, Mike, when you're looking at whether you're not going to allow a project to come into your regional mm-hmm. center? So we will review the loan document and make sure we we understand the loan mechanisms. We aren't going to go in there and really dig into the lender's rights versus other things and whether it's market or off market on some of the smaller deals uh, that are friends and family. But we do make sure there is that loan agreement that it is compliant and that's going to pass USCIS standards in terms of their review of the, the overall project and the viability of the project. Do you see collateral coming in for the loan model? Mm -hmm. We've seen everything from senior loans with actual mortgages being recorded all the way to unsecured. So it really just depends on the deal. Yeah, I would say the same. I would say the same. Well, Mona, what about, you know, we're speaking on on escrow and and all of that, but what about a PPM? Well, a PPM, I would say, and I'm sure Mike would agree with me here, is is always good for the developer to have, If maybe not if they have just their family there, but if there are friends there, because it protects the developer. You know, if everybody signs off that they've had full disclosure, there's a lot less to fight about if you ever go to court. That's exactly it. It's a way to spell out everything and to cover yourself as the project sponsor. Now, as, as you mentioned, if it's just a family member, you probably don't need it. If it's friends, uh, it's getting a little more likely that you should probably have that done. And if you're thinking about bringing in third parties that aren't directly related to the deal, then it's an absolute must to make sure yeah. everyone's on the same page and you're covered. It's like an EB-5 prenup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good point, Mark. It actually is. <laughs> yeah. No, but we're seeing a lot of hybrid now. Like we said, we've seen investors coming in and starting a project. They come in maybe on their own. So of course, no escrow, no PPM when it's that case. Then all of a sudden they're like, oh, you know, you do an economic report and you can you can have, you know, four or five more investors. So then they get family and friends and then they actually go out and, and look for other investors. So that hybrid is coming in within that. 
Yeah, and they've avoided, a lot of them have avoided because of cost for adding a PPM. Mm -hmm. When you have been in the industry as long as we have and you've seen that many problems, it's always a good idea to have as many good documents as you can. You wouldn't think, Bernard, would you, that um, the usage of funds could differ so much from what you put in a business plan or a PPM and then what actually happens? Yeah, um, as you mentioned, you know, the one of the things that we look for is we need to align all of the documents and all those supporting evidence with the business plan. The corporate documents are the documents, the agreements, that operating agreement that you guys mentioned in the past. And and all these legal documents uh, that describes the deal, we have to summarize within the business plan and they have to tie in. So it's uh, it's very important to have those things in a family and friends. Again, as Mike mentioned, you know, we don't typically see private placement memorandums. We typically see those just partnership agreements, operating agreement. But we still, you know, oftentimes during our initial consultation, we'll point them your way, Mona or to counsel's way to get advice on how to <laughs> structure the deal and what legal yeah. documents they need, <laughs> because what they do provide, as Mike said, is not what we, you know, and so we just kind of look at it and go, well, we're not the lawyers, but you need one uh, really bad. <laughs> so you know, having a good immigration attorney. <laughs> Playing a little good cop, bad cop here. Well, I would say that one of the things that we see is on the back end, there's problems for investors that don't think through that, hey, maybe it's my own project. It's my money going into it. I can spend it on whatever I want. And what they don't realize is (laughs) even though it's your own project, you still have to follow the EB-5 regs. So as the regional center, when we're looking at some of the flow of funds, sure, it's all your own money and money can get mingled together. But we need to make sure that the immigration attorney is on that to show that the funds are flowing the right way. Uh, And we're not going to run into a problem later on where they took out a personal loan against the company or moved some of the cash to another account. And even though it's their own money, that could be an EB-5 problem for them. Yeah, that that actually happens very often. I don't know about you guys, but we've started doing what's called I-829 compliance early, where we start I-829 yeah. work almost the minute that the 526 is filed. Because <laughs> otherwise, in our experience now, once the mess is created because of the time it's taking to get to the I-829s, you can't repair it. You're exactly right. And that's a very smart thing that you've done. So us as the regional center now, we've started to collect that flow of funds from year one, showing yeah. exactly what's happening. So it's a light version of the 829 prep, but it's the exact same reason that that you're starting to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we write or we all, I know I know everybody on this call works on documents from the beginning with that 829 in, in mind. If we do that, then our clients will have a much better time then. And so we're, we're always thinking, and that's why I was mentioning that we send them your way because they come up with documents that are, you know, that are not long-term and they come up with projects that are not going to report in a way that's, or they're not describing uh, how the flow of the funds or the uses of the funds are going to be such that we'll be able to easily report. So uh, it's very, very important to think ahead and be prepared. And as Mike mentioned with their process, yeah, but a lot of the issues we see are with the individual projects where, like you said, you can tell the investor, look, spend, this is what you have. You said we are, you're going to spend it on in accordance to the business plan. And all of a sudden they'll come back to us, you know, a year and a half later and they're like, oh, well, I couldn't create the jobs or I couldn't move on with this business. So I decided to open a new business. And you're like, no, wait, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we want to change the location altogether. Yeah, we yeah. have that too. Said, so, oh, we changed our minds. We want to put it in a different county. Is it? No, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> well, Michael Schoenfeld and Bernard Rojano, thank you so much for coming on EB5 Investment Voice. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for being with us today on EB-5 Investment Voice. The topics presented in this podcast is informational in nature and is not to be taken as specific legal advice. If you have questions on the topics presented in this episode or other investment immigration needs, please contact Mona Shaw & Associates. Mona and her attorney staff can be reached at mshawlaw.com. That's M-S-H-A-H law.com. Make sure you don't miss our next episode focusing on a different aspect of the EB-5 program by subscribing to the podcast. While you're at it, leave us a rating on iTunes. If you really found this episode valuable, share it with someone else that could benefit from this information. Until then, I'll see you on the next episode of EB-5 Investment Voice.